It was the winter of 2014, and in Maryland, it was snowing. The Howard County school system was, to the delight of kids everywhere, comically frightened of ice on the streets. Two-hour delays for school were a dime a dozen that week, and I couldn't have been happier, because I had been waking up early to play Dragon Age Inquisition. As a way to start your day, truly few things can beat it. I would creep down the stairs while everyone was asleep and quietly fight bears in the hinterlands until the bus showed up. Being the completionist that I was, who am I kidding? Being the completionist that I am, those mornings would mostly involve rooting for side quests, deliberately delaying the big actions needed to advance the story. And I was having the time of my life. One morning, though, I finally clicked on what I knew was the main story quest. And, well, who the hell are you? Oh no. Shoot. Shoot. Aw. Shoot. Shoot. Wait, how do I say I only have a two-hour delay. I'm gonna have to go to school. It just keeps going. Where do I save? I'm gonna have to go to school. It just keeps going. I can't stop now. And I didn't have to. The stars aligned, and that two-hour delay happened to turn into a full school cancellation. I got a snow day just in time to enjoy this. That was a perfect morning. The bliss of childhood distilled into one experience. Nothing in any video game had ever given me a fraction of that pure feeling up until that point. Nothing afterwards either, until a certain game Bioware would prefer I didn't mention, but that's a different video. I want to talk about Dragon Age Inquisition, because with Veilguard coming out, I think it's important to recognize the elements that worked, or didn't, that may make a reappearance in the sequel. I'm going to focus on my own experience with the game, which will be a narrow view. I never played the previous games. Little middle school me didn't actually know this was the third in a franchise. It's a testament to how well it stood on its own that I didn't pick up that I was missing two whole games right away. I also never had time to play Inquisition more than once or play the DLCs myself. My knowledge of alternative endings, alternative romances, and all the shenanigans that happen in Trespasser are absorbed from other people's let's plays and discussions. So, although it seems very much my cup of tea, I've never played the Templar quest line. I've never put Gaspard on the throne, or Briala for that matter. I still don't know how one even makes that happen. I think there's a locket? God, the party segment was bizarre. I love the concept of it, but it really feels limited by its own gameplay mechanics. I mean, they create this political intrigue level where approval is a quantifiable resource, and then they have you spend the majority of it sneaking around, barely engaging with any of it. Which is fine, that isn't the sort of game Inquisition is, but when you turn around and make that sneaking translate into far-reaching political decisions, it feels... I don't know. For me, it felt a bit disjointed, but that's just my opinion, and that's what this video is about. This is going to be about my personal recollection of my experience, and right out of the gate, let's talk about stakes. Inquisition does a very good job of making things feel like they matter. The world is being ripped apart at the cosmic level. Monsters out of legend are coming out of the woodwork, and you are literally the only one who can stop it. You feel important. Your choices feel important. And that in itself is important. RPGs like this are all about the illusion that your choices matter. And unless you're Baldur's Gate or are planning on blowing up Detroit, the writers usually avoid putting in the actual work to make them actually matter. I went to the Dragon Age writers panel, Dragon Con one year, and upon being asked what they were looking for in potential writers, they broke down that the most critical skill is to be able to create a dialogue tree that appears to branch everywhere, but end up with only two or three choices in the end. And so long as those curated choices feel meaningful, it will work. And I'd say Inquisition did that very well. Your first choice, whether you're going to be an elf, a human, a dwarf, or a kunari, will affect how people react to you. Same with your choice of class, or at least whether you're a mage or not. And once you are actually playing, the game will ask you big questions. Do you use the Templars or the mages to close the rift? Are you allying with either of them? How about the Kunari? Do you want to ally with them? What's your opinion on the Grey Wardens? Here's a Batman's roster of antagonists that you can judge. This is supposed to make sense. I'm judging a box. 
How do you want to punish them? That was the time allotted for rebuttal. End table for orphans. Would you like to drink from this super sketchy sacred pool? Not a scam. Promise. We also have this room we're not using. What do you want to do with it? Hey, how would you like to decorate your throne room? On the subject of thrones, who would you like to sit on the Arlesian throne? On a similar note, want to decide who's Pope? Every single war table mission is basically, here's a problem that if you solve, you'll gain a helpful resource. How do you want to solve it? Diplomatically? Sneakily? With force? These choices don't actually change much about the gameplay, but if the writers make the players care about the world, these choices will still matter to them. However, this strategy can backfire when the audience cares more than the writers do. For example, if you are playing a Dalish elf, like I was, that means that you come from an elvish clan. If you don't pick the correct choices in a specific string of war table missions, you can get your entire clan massacred off screen. Your family, your friends, your mentors, all gone. And the game barely brings it up beyond the token condolences of a few characters. Your character never brings it up at all. Because it really doesn't matter as far as the game is concerned. Your clan never appears in the game, whether they live or die, and you feel this narrative disconnect. This should devastate your character. That is the type of tragedy that would start other characters on their hero or villain arc. But Lavellan? Eh, it was a Tuesday. I'm not really asking for something that big, but I do think that there should be a scene where you are able to mourn their death. Maybe some type of funeral or elvish wake something. But no, it's just a set of choices that you make that's gravity isn't reflected in the game. Well, choices that you can make. I didn't. It got spoiled for me that this was a threat and I looked up what choices I needed to make to keep my clan alive. Which is cheating. Because middle school me was a coward. Writer brain me, on the other hand, is down to ball. Looking back, I think that killing them off is narratively the more interesting option. I mean, if the game refuses to incorporate the clan in the story in any meaningful way, their deaths could at least be a great opportunity for Inquisitor characterization. In concept, anyway. They didn't really do anything with the opportunity. The Inquisitor characterization always takes a backseat anyway to all the other characters, and I can't complain about that. The companion characters were the strength of this game, and especially their interactions with each other. Every time they bickered, or teased, or philosophized, or took solace in one another and random dialogue lines on the open world, was pure gold. I'm a great boss. I'm a firm believer in No Pants Fridays. I'd rather fight for a cause. No Pants Fridays is a cause. Unfortunately for me, I found it difficult to trigger these interactions. I've since looked up the ones I missed, and boy, there are a lot of them. Romances can bloom, entire mental chess matches can be had, therapy sessions can turn into arguments, and arguments can turn into a fashion critique. Solus, what's this whole look of yours about? I'm sorry. No, that outfit is sorry. What are you supposed to be, some kind of woodsman? Every single instance can be delightful windows into who those people are. I love it. And talking to them one-on-one -on -one was my favorite part of the game. Every time I came back to Haven or Skyhold, I would always run the gauntlet of checking to see if every single companion had anything else to say. There was such a delightful range of opinion. They were different. Their beliefs were different. And the writers did a solid job of taking each character's ideology seriously. They felt real, and their arguments felt meaningful. And their opinion of you rising and falling were the real stakes in this game. No, I, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. Whether they like you or not doesn't change the story very much, even when it probably should. But how important it is to the story doesn't matter. My friendship with wizard Freddie Mercury matters to me, goddammit, and that's the point. With the amount of killing you do, a bit of flair's a fine thing. I don't kill that many people. Are you joking? I'm only surprised you didn't kill someone walking over here. Why is he the only one who points this out? These relationships define this game. You're given the time to grow comfortable with them, confront their pasts, forge their futures. You can play poker with them, help them cause chaos, help with their drug problems, make them write smutty literature, get them to read smutty literature, walk in their dreams, hit them with a stick, save them from an execution they probably deserve, 
fundamentally alter the very nature of their existence. You know, normal things. You can even go to the spa, though this was in the DLC I never played, and I wish something like that existed in the main game because Vivian was tragically lacking in screen time and development. But I suppose it is a compliment to the game that my biggest complaints with Inquisition really boil down to wanting more. Take Corypheus, you know, the main villain. He's an interesting concept with an insane backstory brimming with cosmic implications that they barely explore. So despite everything, he reads as a pretty cookie-cutter antagonist. You relate to other villains more, you hate others more, you fear others more. I mean, the Nightmare Demon in the Fade mission completely <laughs> stole the show. Terrifying concept. Solid execution. Perfect delivery. Sarah, Sarah, Sarah. If you shoot an arrow at me, I'll know where you are. He had more menace in his one mission than Corypheus had in the whole game. The Kunari will make a lovely host for one of my minions. Or maybe I will light his body myself. Why wasn't this the main villain? Oh my god. The thing is, he kind of is. The Nightmare and Corypheus have the same voice actor. He's a reflection of the Inquisitor's fears. And the Inquisitor fears Corypheus. Perhaps I should be afraid, facing the most powerful members of the Inquisition. <laughs> and the voice actor killed it. Corypheus falling short is 100% a writing problem. You will kneel. He comes across as kind of stupid and incompetent. His claims to godhood are undercut by the rest of the cast at every opportunity. Whatever, it's a minor problem. My main point is that they let us deal with the nightmare way too fast. Honestly, the whole Fade mission feels like that for me. They gave us a taste of something so cool and creative and intense, and it was over way too fast. But I'm a sucker for this kind of concept, so I know I'm biased. Speaking of things that the writers decided to skip over... I will only be analyzing the soulless romance because that's what I played through. I did see the Cullen one because that's who my mom romanced and I watched that unfold over her shoulder. And let me tell you, when I was watching my mom get as many kisses as she wanted, get actual romance scenes and, you know, a, a sex scene, I was very annoyed. I don't know, Solas. Why do you think I would be annoyed? Hmm? Why don't I have an option to make out on the ramparts as many times as I want? How many kisses did we get exactly? Three? I don't really mind that there are no sex scenes in the Solas romance. I would not lay with you under false pretenses. It's perfectly understandable given the situation. If I understand correctly, Josephine also doesn't have a sex scene, but at least she gets an entire subplot where you duel for her hand with rapiers. That sounds awesome. Where could I get some of that, Solace? I find it difficult to explain my opinion on the Solace romance because I simultaneously believe it to be the worst romance mechanically, but easily the best conceptually. From what I remember, the entire romance of Solace is this. While he is talking to you in a fade dream, which is not a romance exclusive scene, you can initiate a kiss. After you both wake up, he will be unsure and say he has to think about it. Later, you have a conversation on your balcony, which is not a romance exclusive scene, but can culminate in a kiss, officially starting the romance. Then you can have a dance at the end of the intrigue mission, which is, dear God, why did they put you in that hat? Your tailor should be shot, Solus. I probably pay your tailor's salary. I should be shot. Dear God. <sighs> this is a romance exclusive scene, but isn't exclusive to Solace. Every romance gets a variation of this dance. The next romantic scene you get is unique to him. It's the one where he breaks up with you. That's right. The only in-game cinematic unique to Solace's romance is his breakup. To put this into perspective, you can read poetry to Cassandra, you can roll around in the hay with Blackwall, Iron Bull will give you an entire BDSM course culminating in sex on the war table, Sarah, Dorian, Josephine all have quests related to their romance, they all do, all except Solus. I mean, how is that fair? When I was at the Dragon Age Dragon Con panel, I called them out. Why doesn't Solus get a complete romance? And they told me two things. One, 
both the Solus and Cullen romances were last minute additions to the game. If they feel underbaked in the narrative oven, that's because they actually are. But that doesn't explain everything. Cullen has unlimited kisses and several romance scenes. It easily eclipses the soulless romance in content. Because there is a separate consideration, and that is dialogue quantity. Apparently, Bioware has a limit to the amount of dialogue that they will give to a single character. And Solus, because the plot used him as the exposition god, reached that limit. That's right. The writer's understandable overuse of Gareth David Lloyd's delicious Welsh accent to explain the story to the player meant he literally didn't have the words to spare for his romance. And that explains everything. That's why almost all his romance scenes are just extensions or modifications on pre-existing scenes. That's why the only one unique to him is the one where he cuts it off. Because that one was necessary, and that was probably the only one they could spare the words to do. It is actually a writing feat at how much they were able to accomplish with so little. With a few scant words, they managed to capture a tragic yearning that few full-length stories can grasp. Let me help you, Solus. I cannot do that to you, Vernon. But you would do it to yourself? There is only death on this journey. I would not have you see what I become. There's good stuff here. The kiss was impulsive and ill-considered. You say that, but you're the one who started with tongue. I did no such thing. Oh, does it not count if it's only fade tongue? Great, even. I would say that it probably is just one scene off from feeling complete. Because my big problem with it, besides the noticeable lack of unlimited kisses, is the narrative flow. Basically, as soon as you get together with him, it's over before you can grasp what your relationship is even like. They just needed one unique scene between that balcony kiss and breaking up. I don't particularly care what it is. A study date, a wall painting session, a romantic walk in a shared fade dream, something to establish the relationship that we have before it gets ripped all away. Those of us who enjoy this romance are here for the pain. Let us feel that loss. As it stands, the entire relationship lives in subtext and in the imagination of the player. And boy, does it! For a romance that was cobbled together last minute, strangled by a word count limit, and barely on screen, it is thriving in the Dragon Age fanbase. Why? Well, for one, the lack of content means people will naturally fill the gap themselves with enthusiasm. But more than that, it is the romance with the most far-reaching consequences. Sure, there are political ramifications in dating Blackwall, or Dorian, or Sarah, or the Iron Bull, but those consequences are unlikely to outlast Inquisition itself. Romancing Solus fundamentally alters the nature of the sequel's antagonist's actions. You have elf Loki, who doesn't see the world or the people in it as real. He intends to overwrite the whole of reality to return the glory of what was. Then he befriends you and realizes the people in the world he intends to destroy are real and meaningful in their own right. We aren't even people to you. Not at first. You showed me that I was wrong. Then he falls in love with you, and through that love realizes that his heart lies in this new world. And he intends to destroy it all anyway. I will save the elven people, even if it means this world must die. He knows it will ruin him. He knows it's monstrous. He knows it's evil. But he continues what he perceives as his duty to go through with it, just as it's your duty to stop him. You don't need to destroy this world. I'll prove it to you. I would treasure the chance to be wrong once again, my friend. He's practically begging you to stop him and he loves you still. It is fundamentally changing the threat of world destruction into a personal story of self-destruction. And that's compelling. In concept, no other romance in this game even comes close to this in scope. Next to this, you think the Cullen romance matters? Of course it matters, I love him. But Cullen's lyrium addiction will not destroy all of Thetis. Romancing Solus feels like you are a few words away from seducing someone out of destroying the world. 
you're not, the game won't stray from its narrow track, but the what-ifs inherent to the concept captures the imagination. So even when the majority of the story is in your imagination, it still resonates all the way into Veilgard. And that's a potential problem. Unlike all the others, Solus's romance is incomplete. The writing more or less promises to conclude in the sequel, which would be fine, but my guess is it's an empty promise. I mean, did the writers understand the implications of throwing this last minute romance in? The wide range of expectations for the sequel this would create? Expectations I'm sure they have no intention of satisfying. There are people who want to kill him for breaking their heart, redeem him, even join him, but none of that is going to happen. Veilgard will have a new protagonist. It's not about the Inquisitor, so the Inquisitor's relationship with Solus is probably not going to matter, even though it probably should. Putting aside the romance, just having low versus high approval with him does change how regretful or resolved he is in his villainy at the end of Trespasser. They could reflect that in Veilgard, but honestly, I really really doubt Bioware will bother. I would love to be wrong about that, but that's my guess. They are going to do whatever they want with Solus, and our choices interacting with him in Inquisition won't matter. Because, as I said, in these types of games, choice is an illusion. But you guys can tell me what happens. I've barely watched any promotional material for Veilguard. I've avoided every headline and every controversy, and I'm not going to play the game right now. These AAA titles are much too expensive on launch. Instead, I'm going to use this as an excuse to play the original Dragon Age, which I got for like $10 during a Steam sale. I've been meaning to play it for years, so while everyone on YouTube reviews Veilguard, I'm going to analyze the story of Origins. Please subscribe if you would like to be notified when I do. And if you would like an action-packed epic fantasy from the perspective of a sentient cursed sword, do check out my book Bonesong, Diary of a Sentient Sword. The first 10 chapters are completely free, and all chapters afterwards are about 10 cents, sometimes less. Link in the comments. Thank you for the support.